are these people? I wanted to um, get to two different articles that came out of the Taibi Twitter files, FOIA files, censorship, industrial complex stuff that, that he's been all over for the better part of 18 months. Um, so the first one actually happened about a month ago. And I didn't really hear, hear anybody talk about it, but it was really important because if you remember the 2020 election, and I think some of us do, one of the organizations that was highly influential was that, um, no, Anna, we're not doing a, any Rockfin uh, on the on the redo because we just crashed and I'm just, I'm just not setting one up. A pain in the butt. Sorry. Oh, Rockfin, it's a pain in the ass. Um, Stanford Internet Observatory, again, has been very highly influential when it came to um, the election, to censoring Twitter, to... They hired this woman named Renee DeResta. They had uh, this guy recently who just resigned from the Stan Stanford Internet Observatory. But then we find out that not just he lost his job, but everybody lost their job. So everybody, everybody lost their job because the you center lose your job was the and leading. You lose your job. Yeah. So the cert, the Stanford Internet Observatory is brought to heel. Now, Andrew Lowenthal had actually written one of the Twitter files articles way back like a year ago. He's from Australia. He says karma has just caught up with the Stanford Internet Observatory which will be scaled back to just three staff, according to the Washington Post. The contracts of its leading protagonists or propagandists, Alex Stamos and Renee DeResta, have not been renewed. Yay! Yay! You know, we hate people losing their jobs, but propagandists losing their jobs. Yeah, exactly. All right. It was former CIA fellow DeResta that led the Stanford Internet Observatory's signature initiatives, the Election Integrity Project, the EIP, and the Virality Project, VP. Of course, the Virality Project was around censoring COVID stuff. Election Integrity Partnership ended up running the tabletop exercise that pre-gamed all of the Hunter Biden laptop censorship for the social media companies. That As was just Russian propaganda. Russian God. scum. You and your damn emails. SIO's demise is a result of a string of efforts, including those of Racket Public, the Missouri v. Biden plaintiffs, the New Civil Liberties Alliance, the Disinformation Chronicle, the Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government, and many more. Network Effects also contributed original research. Founded with a $5 million donation from Craig Newmark. We know who he is, especially, you know, Craigslist, Craig Newmark. Mm. SIO took countering misinformation to new heights. The Virality Project advised its big tech partners to consider true stories to be misinformation. Of course they did. All right. Stanford. Uh, standard vaccine misinformation on your platform. Yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Of course, booby. They can they they accuse false or misleading posts from the accounts of well-known repeat offenders. So what do they want? They want booby censored. That that's RFK Junior. Yeah. Not actual like boobies, but um, yep. Uh, we're back at another stream on YouTube, guys. Uh, that that has this title of censorship industrial complex. And thank you for jumping over to rumble. Everybody who has and rumbles kick ass because as we continue our stream, they don't actually drop our stream, but we actually have a new stream over on the INN channel as well as my own. I believe, I hope so. Uh, it's supposed to be running live. If not, then we're just over on rumble, mm -hmm. but um, it's up on YouTube. I think so too. What, what he says is that he unearthed that document while assisting Matt Taibbi with the Twitter files research just in time for his and Schellenberger's testimony before the select subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government. That was last March. 
It's for it's perhaps the most egregious example of the Internet Research and Digital Rights Fields 180, an inorganic flip that undermined a decades long commitment to free expression. An infiltration by the intel community, you mean, into the um, academic community, which there always really has been. But somebody convinced the people at the social media companies that these academics that were also CIA agents were leading experts when it came to misinformation and censorship. Yeah, that really happened. Inorganic, because the EIP and VP, the Election Integrity Partnership and Virality Partnership, were not research initiatives, as is often claimed. They were seeded by the security state, namely the Department of Homeland Security and the Cybersecurity uh, and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is CISA, as demonstrated by emails released by the House Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. Below the Atlantic Council's Graham Brookie, an EIP VP project partner, explains that we just set up an election integrity partnership at the request of DHS CISA. So Renee DeResta, who was lying through her fucking teeth, claiming that this was completely independent of any intel agency or anything having to do with the federal government. Absolute fucking lie. And you can see that this was disseminated throughout the Atlantic Council from Graham Brookie. All right. The Atlantic Council is essentially yep. NATO's think tank, and, it include, and its board includes Pfizer CEO Albert Borla, the former Na direct, Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, former Secretary General of NATO, the Honorable Lord Robinson, former U.S. Secretary of Defense and CIA Director Leon Panetta, Tara Reid's former boss, Goldman Sachs Secretary of the Board John F. W. Rogers, and many, many, many more. As Taibbi further demonstrated, Twitter was aware of the Election Integrity Partnership's links to the intel community, which, again... He discovered throughout his Twitter files and now also through the FOIA file, through the FOIA uh, files, where they're now reverse engineering the Twitter files through FOIA requests and finding out through public documentation of people's emails exactly what was discussed between public officials and both these university officials and the social media companies and the intel agencies. That's not classified. Right. So when content takedown recommendations came into Twitter, they knew they were more than just serving suggestions. The content of those requests was made clear after the Stanford Internet Observatory was forced to release details of their internal flagging system. This again via Taibbi's reporting. And they had all of these different labels. This is being shared to Facebook. And while it's been labeled, shared in a group, Official page shares didn't receive such a label. We recommend lab labeling all instances of the article being shared on Facebook. I mean, this is literally just nanny state internet police self-appointed by the U.S. government. Right? We found this out a month ago that they disbanded this organization. Furthermore, that virality project, just to remind you why they're disbanding it, because it was a, nar a narrative changing and narrative shaping Intel state operation that got exposed, partly by the Twitter files, right? Virality Project was in close contact with the White House and hosted Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, Murphy for a discussion on health misinformation. Oh, God. They also had Not a pipe... Vivek. No, no, not that Vivek. Not not <laughs> Ramis Marmy. Um, yeah. They also had pipeline level access to more than 50 million COVID related tweets per day. Oh, that seems like it would be a good idea to put the COVIDians in charge of 50 million tweets a day and which one should be censored. That's fine. This was in no way an insignificant research project, right? They said they were releasing a new free endpoint in Twitter developer labs that delivers the full fidelity, real-time public tweets about COVID-19. We know that our standard API has limitations to make it 
difficult. Now, this is I'm reading from the email up here. Difficult to adequately study this topic due to its volume. This new stream will will include all tweets related to COVID as classified by our tweet annotations, because they're the experts, of course. Just ask them. We intend to publish the keywords and hashtags of the tweet annotation powering the COVID-19 topic so you have transparency into the contents of the stream and can supplement as needed. Which, of course, they don't. They never did that. Oh, right. Uh Uh-huh. The Virality Project pushed to censor other academics such as Martin Koldorf, a former Harvard professor of epidemiology, and a former member of the CDC's vaccine safety subgroup. So as Alex Guttentag and and Andrew had reported, the Virality Project had played a major role in censoring Koldorf. On March 15, 2021, that's a year after the lockdown started, Koldorf had tweeted, quote, thinking that everyone must be vaccinated is as scientifically flawed as thinking that nobody should. COVID vaccines are important for older high-risk people and their caretakers. Those with prior natural infection do not need it, nor children. Safe and effective, safe and effective. That's Martin Koldorf saying that, not in the YouTube. (laughs) Now, Uh Rumble, Rockfin, and everybody else, that's a whole different story. But as far as YouTube is concerned, they're safe and effective. I love love how you coughed and died right after you said (laughs) that. That's definitely... Right? Definitely doesn't say anything, does it? Safe for the fail. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, many outlets describe the Stanford Internet Observatory's demise as the result of sustained right-wing campaign by conservative outlets and ignore the corruption at the heart of the project. Predictably, Stanford, DeResta, Stamos, and their supporters shout, everything is right-wing, as John, they scramble to come up with John a narrative. Stamos? Well, maybe. No, it's Alex Stamos. It might be John's <laughs> brother or Damn. cousin. But they shout that everything's right wing. Uncle Jesse for a second. No, Uncle Jesse. Uncle Jesse, that's what my kids call Jesse now. But uh, <laughs> as, the, as they scramble to come up with a narrative that deflects accountability for their actions, they're screaming everything is right wing. Because everything that I disagree with is right wing. All right. So. Dude, those pants do make you look right wing. Well. So. Pants check. I am wearing shorts. The truth Mm -hmm. is, is that the Stanford is just that SIO was doing something egregiously wrong and was targeting people regardless of ideology. Those reporters could easily find out that uh, could find that out. The lead tweet of Taibbi's house testimony has been viewed more than 40 million times. Right. So Stamos and DeResta will, of course, find other work. I think the, that the rest of has already found another job. Stamos already has, starting with a company, starting a company with former CISA head Chris Krebs. And I think we even covered that. Meanwhile, the rest of has a new book out, endorsed surprisingly by Jonathan Haidt, who was among the top signatories of the Westminster Declaration. That's kind of weird. Hypocritical. Yep. Maybe that's why guys like C.J. Hopkins didn't want to sign it. Or maybe he did want to sign it, but then they kicked him off because he called it a sham. Oh, right. That's what happened. That's right, Michael Schellenberger. We saw that. Despite SIO crumbling accountability, still appears to be sorely lacking. Uh, despite, yes, despite SIO crumbling, comma, accountability still appears to be sorely lacking. The rest appeared top of the bill at a recent Yale conference on propaganda. Yes, because Yale is deep in disseminating propaganda, skull and bones. Yeah, they've never they've never had a club that involved, you know, bits and pieces of people and whatnot. It's never happened. Bad never had cookies. A bush, bush in that club. Bad cookies asking the question, isn't that a conflict of interest? Yeah, I think it quite might be if you're it might possibly if you're that. advocating Maybe. and endorsing Rene DeResta while also signing the Westminster Declaration, you might be an op. What's, What's up, up with that? that? What's, What's up, up with that? that? Dude, I, that's 
That's becoming my favorite sound bit. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> it should good, never have it? gone this far. A properly self-regulating anti-disinformation field would have sniffed out bad actors early, but the conversation in the ecosystem is broken. SIO shouldn't be the last center to be shut down or see leadership changes. Yeah, we're going to show you the next one right now. Breaking basic research <laughs> ethics, hiding your relationship with government and intelligence agencies, protecting corporate products from proper scrutiny, and pushing for the censorship of other academics is not free academic inquiry or free speech. It's corruption and it's censorship, which he didn't say there. Andrew's nonprofit, LiberNet, will be strengthening their efforts over the coming months to bring accountability to other leading civil society censorship initiatives. Meanwhile, the Stanford Internet Observatory leaves a malign legacy having damaged the reputation of the anti-disinformation field and academia more broadly. The question is, will the anti-disinformation field clean house, which we know they won't, or continue to ignore the corruption within its ranks, which we know it likely will because Clint Watts is still employed. Links to Andrew's past Stanford Inf Internet Observatory and Virality Project related content can be found below. Andrew does great work. I actually was trying to get him on the show and try to work out a time to, uh, to interview him and talk to him about this whole thing. But we just weren't able to do that. And I kind of needed to pull a story in tonight. I'm like, you know what? Nobody's talked about the fact that this thing shut down. It was a major factor in impacting the tabletop exercise and impacting the 2020 election. And now they don't exist. And they're going to show, they're going to resurface somewhere else and they'll, they'll pop up elsewhere and try to infect their narrative into the 2020 or election cycle. I don't have any doubt or misgivings about that. What do you think about? The Stanford Internet Observatory. I mean, sounds like another industrial complex of mal, mis, and dis information. You know, well, pretty much whatever goes against the powerful, they have to go get. You know? Well, and, and so, I think that... Um, stamp out any discontent. And, and marking, you know, look, we... Just like with with uh, independent platforms, it's platform whack-a-mole. We have to keep moving around and stay nimble and one step ahead. And these guys are, the censors are mm -hmm. trying to do the same thing with us. They're trying to stay one step ahead with their agencies, and we've got to watch them like a hawk and be ever mindful of what they're up to. And don't take your eye off what Renee DeRest is up to, because you can guarantee she's not going anywhere. These people don't disappear. Yeah. They're like parasites. They just rebrand. The other article that came out of Racket News slash the, the FOIA files this week was out of Clemson University. Um, and actually, it was out of Racket News. James Rushmore, who I'd never heard of. Um, but this was actually a really interesting article that I read earlier today. This is a paid article, so you need to be a paid subscriber to Racket News in order to be able to read this, but I'm going to share this and I'm going to read through this with everyone and let you see what's been going on with Clemson University. So what happened here was that they have been working, uh, Racket News has been working alongside Undead FOIA to work on a project, and we covered this a few weeks ago, to work on a project to submit a mass amount of FOIA requests about the censorship industrial complex, about the communication between um, between universities and public officials and private companies and anything that they can get their hands on publicly. So James publishes this the other day. The FOIA request that we sent to Clemson University reveals a tight-knit relationship between university professors, federal law enforcement, and the news media. Ah, huh. go figure. Yeah. So, like we said, Stanford wasn't the only university that's, that's participating in this. You've got societies, and you've got projects, and you've got groups all around the country at different universities that are monitoring on behalf of the federal government, 
on behalf of the intelligence community, and they've got spies everywhere. So James writes, if you've read the Twitter files, you are likely already aware of the social media platform's interactions with Clemson University's Media Forensics Hub. The relationship between the two parties was tense. Internal communications confirmed Twitter's annoyance with Clemson's practice of running to the press with claims that Russian trolls were running rampant on their site. In May 2020, Yoel Roth, we know him very famously from the Twitter files, then the head of site integrity at Twitter, he would later become their, I believe, lead general counsel or the head of um, security, information security. But then he was head of site integrity. He voiced some of those concerns to Nick Pickles, which I love saying that name, <laughs> Nick, Nick Pickles, you the know, company's senior global like strategist. Rugrats character? Maybe. The senior global strategist for public policy. So back in May of 2020, Nick Pickles wrote that given that they have a <laughs> U.S. government relationship, all right, happy for the D.C. team to pick up the relationship, but I've spoken to them in the past and similarly share Yoel's frustration that they don't take any sort of guidance on what they found. Of course not. Yeah. Right? So here, what's happening, Yoel Roth was saying that we've said a bunch of times, we're still happy to work directly with you on this instead of via NBC. Right? So you can see right there that they're using a cutout of NBC to funnel this stuff directly into Twitter. So that they can have this disconnect and, and plausible deniability and say, well, we're not feeding it to Twitter. NBC is. Yeah, but you're giving it to NBC. What do you think is happening? And you're telling them to give it to them. What was um Vijaya? Vijaya. What was what was Vijaya up to? Lead Did general count that was lead general counsel for Twitter at the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Vijaya even knew about this. But <laughs> Shut your mouth. Well, Vijaya um, does Vijaya does like to stay closed. Um <laughs> Roth also took you got issue. Nick Pickles and Vijaya, dude. Don't even don't even <laughs> act like that's normal. Someone Roth, set that up, dude. <laughs> Yoel Roth also took issue with the hub's persistent attribution of certain accounts uh, to Russian trolls. Later that same month, he questioned the hub's <laughs> Russia-heavy focus because they were designed and put there to be able to, to stoke fear about Russia and to plant stories about Russia, right? So he says there, the you, uh, the you haven't attributed to Russia in a while comment is particularly revelatory of their motivations, IMO. Um, yeah, because they're accusing Twitter of... Helping Russia, which is amazing. What is the yeah. Media Forensics Hub? Well, let's go back. Described as an interdisciplinary team of researchers working to study and combat online deception. Yeah, the censors of the censors. Who's monitoring the monitors, right? The project kicked off in 2017. That was the year communications professor Darren Linville and economics professor Patrick Warren joined forces to uncover and expose millions of tweets they attributed to Russian trolls. Sponsored by mm. the taxpayer-funded South Carolina Research Authority, the hub was officially launched in May of 2020. Two years later, along with the University at Buffalo and several other institutions, it received a $5 million grant from the National Science Foundation. All for a yeah. bunch of bullshit to make up stuff about Russian trolls on Twitter. Man. Probably. A, dude, they had, someone had to code Hamilton 69. What the hell are you we know? doing? What the? We should be petitioning and getting some of this money. At least we're doing legitimate work mm -hmm. to expose shit. Last yeah. May, Racket filed a FOIA request with Clemson. Our search produced a series of emails that make explicit reference to the university's dealings with federal law enforcement agencies, <laughs> providing Clemson help with resources, among other things, right? So social media companies and the news media. Okay, so again, 
Clemson is making deals with law enforcement, social media companies, and the media. The Clemson files are difficult to summarize, but offer probably the most comprehensive portrait we've gotten yet of the role of that such ostensibly non-governmental anti-disinformation, quote-unquote, research institutions can play as middleman organizations. These emails also document the high degree of influence the school had with federal agencies and the media, even if Twitter was not always as cooperative. So they had vase. They had their vase. This is really scary shit. So again, you've got a combination. This is like literally the way they describe fascism, right? You've got corporations, government. Motel Mussolini described fascism, but yes. Corporations, government, mm -hmm. academia, all, and, and then non-governmental organizations, NGOs that are funded by the government, or part, at least in part. Like, how is this? This is bad. A summary of key communications is listed below, while three new batches of documents have been uploaded to the Racket FOIA library, where, as always, they are not paywalled. So everybody can go and read this stuff. Hmm. On March 7th, 2020, and that is about a week before they started locking people in their houses in the United States, Linville messaged Yoel Roth to discuss his team's work monitoring alleged Russian activity on the platform. This was also three days, by the way, after Super Tuesday, or four days. Roth, as it should be noted, was recently affiliated with both the Atlantic Council's Task Force for a Trustworthy Future Web and the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information Disorder. Recently. Russian scum! So they take care of their own. Yoel had to go and hide in the, in, in the bathroom for about a year, afraid that somebody was going to come after him for all the stuff that he did and all the people that he censored. Nobody did. And then the censorship industrial complex came and gave him a job at the Aspen Institute and at the Atlantic Council. The kings of censorship, both Aspen Institute, famously. Well, Twitter, Twitter doesn't have a problem with this. Now they fixed it. The Elon fixed a free speech. Uh huh. Free speech now. Right. The WEF lady came in and fixed it. It's uh -huh. fine. Yes, you can tell by it's everybody's fine. massive reach that doesn't pay. I the bet the most reach, very reach, much wow. Right. You know, Linville told Roth that he had hoped to have the accounts in question suspended before Super Tuesday four days earlier, before making reference to CNN chief international correspondent Clarissa Ward, or on her below. Linville then hinted at the level of coordination between his team, CNN, and federal law enforcement agencies. Quote, I'm not sure what CNN or the feds have shared with you, but it's likely our list has been updated since you got information from either party. Yeah, that's not cool. They're all working in cahoots together. Darren Linville, Kevin Kane, Patrick Warren, but also now directly sending the email to Yoel Roth. So we see that. I saw you were working from home. How did you see that? Maybe he tweeted that he was. Maybe he saw on Slack that he put through their secret Slack communications or on WhatsApp. That was the name of the damn app I couldn't think of earlier. That, this, that mm. the Amazonians could be using potentially, but WhatsApp or, chats. Or, or maybe. DMs? Maybe. She even caught me on camera. It wasn't me. They were FaceTiming? Teams? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they use there. Probably. Skype? It's worth emphasizing that the Media Forensics Hub was still in development at this point. It wouldn't even officially launch for another two months in May. So all of this communication is going on behind the scenes as they're creating this censorship bureau. It's so freaking insidious, all of this. In a follow-up email, Linville made note of Twitter's decision to suspend some of the accounts. Namely, those that CNN had given Twitter. And how was CNN given the, the list to give to Twitter? It was funneled directly from these clowns. The significance mm. of this correspondence cannot be understated. For Dear one, Mr. Pickles, 
We are sending you this information. We hope it reaches you well. <laughs> For one, it reveals that CNN was in the habit of contacting Twitter with the names of accounts it attributed to Russian trolls. Yeah. Why is CNN reaching out to Twitter with that shit? Number one. Number two, at the same well, time... they've been listening to Hamilton 69, bro. No, they thought they knew. No, this is this is March of 2020. There is no Hamilton 69 yet. Mm, still 68, I guess. No, not even. At the mm. same time, it also <laughs> underscores Twitter's hesitancy <laughs> to accept many of the Clemson professor's claims... The platform was much more inclined to take action in response to CNN's claims of, of account inauthenticity. So what would happen? Emails from the hub, by contrast, were less likely to spur a response on Twitter's end. So I think the hub ended up figuring that out and started funneling their requests directly through the media. And all of a sudden, you see a lot mm. fewer hub requests and a lot more media requests. When reached for comment, Linville wrote, this NGO was in refer this email was in reference to a Russian supported troll farm operating under the guise of an NGO in Ghana and Nigeria and working to influence conversations here in the States. Sure, buddy. After Russian I done scum. Yeah, he's he's got about as much credibility as Keith Oberman. After identifying <laughs> after identifying the coordinated activity on social media. We partnered with CNN on reporting the story. They did a fantastic job. Clarissa Ward and her team traveled to Ghana, uncovered the campaign, and interviewed one of the individuals in charge. CIA. What? No. They would yep. never do anything like that. Um, like the literal, it's like a Bond movie. What are you talking about? Right? Where they literally have like the cardboard yeah. office set up in Ghana for her to walk into with the CIA agent yeah, acting dude. like he's the freaking Hughes. Hughes there in a pith helmet. <laughs> like, excuse me, Mr. Bond. Wow. You know? Ugh. In a subsequent email, you Roth noted his eagerness to help Linville, but he also expressed some reservations about Linville's conclusions. Quote, I'd like, I, I note that activities similar to what the network was engaged in may not actually be connected to the same actors. Yeah, meaning, and that, and there's not a lot out there that's similar that's decided not Russian. The same attribution challenges we've discussed in the past. Apparently, he's been calling that bullshit for a while. Linville encouraged Roth to trust his team's judgment. Trust me, bro before making a comment about how various federal agencies, social media analytics from Graphica, remember Ben Nimmo, who used to work in the, the Obama administration, is now running Graphica. Finding, finding Nimmo? Maybe. And CNN have all been <laughs> looped in on the alleged Russian accounts. Again, they're all in one big circle jerk about Russian nonsense that doesn't actually exist. In order to whip that the sounds... public into a frenzy. That sounds very similar to another phrase, uh, you know. Well, but take for it what you will. What do I know? One big club. Yep, yeah, and you ain't in it. Linville declined to name which specific agencies his team contacted. Quote, when we identify malign foreign influence with possible national security influence, as was clearly the case here, we inform appropriate authorities. It's worth mentioning that in an interview mm -hmm. with PBS in 2022, Linville concluded, of course, that Russian trolls aren't as common as people think they are, but they are there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So are Ukrainian trolls that are funded by the Defense Department and call themselves NAFO. <clears throat> Check out Meme Wars on our channel. Big thanks to Clarenberg for putting that article out. Right. NAFO, appreciate you. On March 11th, Linville asked Roth and Twitter threat intelligence lead uh, Patrick Conlin. We used to talk about, we talked about him because he's formerly the Department of Defense and he used to work for the DOD and other federal intelligence agencies and no one ever vetted him, really. So yep. Linville asked them about the suspension of an account that his team hadn't flagged for removal. He asked them about the possibility of taking more strategic approaches the questions of account suspension as his team hoped to continue tracking smaller accounts. Now, this is what's crazy. 
This interaction is part of a recurring pattern in which Clemson researchers sought to forge a closer relationship with Twitter, with Twitter's moderation team, right? So what it says was yeah. a major area of disagreement between Linville and Roth concerned Twitter's approach to removing accounts. Roth wanted them gone. He insisted that no one benefits from the continued presence of inauthentic activity on social media and encouraged Linville to hand over the names of any accounts his team may have been keeping to themselves. He even invoked former special counsel Robert fucking Mueller. Come on. Really? He did. Yep. We in the Senate Intelligence Committee and Robert Mueller have all called for open info sharing here. No one benefits from the continued presence of inauthentic activity on social media. Mueller. Just, just tell me what accounts I can ban for you, sir. Linville then responds uh -huh. by explaining his team's Please reasoning. Please let me lick your boots, sir. Mm. Linville responds by explaining his team's reasoning. He wanted Twitter to preserve the smaller accounts because they were less likely to gain traction, but more likely to waste the alleged Russian network's time and resources. He also believed that maintaining such accounts would help his team better understand the network's tactics and behavior. He wanted to study them and then hopefully that they'll lead, they'll lead him to the big fish. I mean, it's, yeah. he, he thinks he's Columbo. Right. Roth, one more thing. Roth argued that Linville's preferred strategy was not the one we choose to advance in this space based on our approach and the approach of the rest of the industry to combating these threats. We don't let them go and monitor and watch them and hope they do something so that we can catch them later. We just shut them the fuck down, is what he's saying. At the same time, he acknowledged that working with Linville's findings would probably prove more efficient than waiting for law enforcement. No wonder why he got a job at the Aspen in, at the Aspen Institute now. On March 12th, Linville's partner, economics professor Patrick Warren, jumped into the conversation. He claimed that the feds and CNN were much more receptive to Clemson to the Clemson professor's input than Twitter was. You know, well, these guys believe me. Why don't you? Come on, bro. He described how CNN had provided them with a researcher and cited how Clarissa Ward and her team had traveled to Africa to follow up on their research because it was set up by us. Mm -hmm. He also noted that law enforcement had been open with Linville and Warren to the extent that they can, under regulatory re restrictions, and uh, that they can, and mentioned that, that they'd shared resources with the club's team. It's all on the hush-hush. Come on, man. We can't really tell you, but, but we're going to tell you anyway. Make you feel really important. Holy shit. As strained as the dynamic between Twitter and Clemson could be, I can't believe there even is a dynamic. CNN's relationship with the two parties appeared much more amicable. Fuck you, CNN. The news network was willing to share alleged Russian tweets with the platform while also providing the Clemson professors with research personnel. This is literally the Clinton News oh, Network. Oh, those Russians. This is the Clinton News Network come to life right here. The Anderson Cooper CIA-led news network. News network. <laughs> yep. The Warren email, and that's not Elizabeth Warren, but, but the partner of this Clem Clemson project. The Warren email also reveals the sophisticated nature of Clemson's collaboration with federal agencies. His third point is especially salient. That what resources and information did those law, what resources and information did those law enforcement agencies provide? When asked for comment, Warren wrote, emphasis hours, at the same time, our impression was that the FBI had been following up with local investigations and foreign partners. Twitter, in contrast, didn't seem to be dedicating any significant effort to this project. And then we find out that the FBI really hadn't been. So it was really CNN, but of course we know that it was CNN funded by and led by the U.S. government or somebody affiliated with them and funded by the U.S. government. Linville also made reference to his team's relationship with federal law enforcement in a July 2019 email to Yoel Roth. 
according to Linville, this guy, again, this, this guy, Linville, he ran the, the Clemson project here. He and his team regularly share what they've learned as well as accounts they feel are suspicious with various federal agencies. Of course they do, because they're all in cahoots together. Linville also described how he'd spent an hour talking to CNN, spent an hour talking CNN out of running a story that he believed to be rooted in limited information and too little analysis. Who the hell are you to decide, dude? Well, he self-appointed Twitter cops. That's what these guys are. The censorship yep. police. Regulators. Yep. A subsequent email from Roth to Warren and Linville sheds further light on the nature of CNN's relationship with both Twitter and the Clemson team. According to Roth, Twitter was in the habit of sharing data with CNN, and at one point, CNN sent the hub an unofficial version of the information they'd gathered. What does he say? Thank you very much, my friends. It looks like we missed this one as we're parsing out the AI face accounts from the Ghanaian ones. <laughs> we sent our data to CNN as we're still working on finalizing it, so it's a little surprising they shared a non-final set with y'all, but it seems like this worked out. Yeah, it sure did. For who? Linville and Warren's discussions with social media platforms weren't limited to Twitter. In March 2022, Linville contacted Facebook moderation leads Olga Belagova, Belagova and David Agronovich. Yeah, that's formerly, kind of no, thank you. David Agronovich is formerly the National Security Council because you so you know that he's got no intel ties. Belogolova. <laughs> Mr. Belogolova. Yeah. <laughs> is she bombastic? Olga's bombastic. Yeah, I hope so. Right? Super fantastic. Yes. So, so <laughs> Linville contacted fa Facebook moderation leads to express doubt about the viability of a proposed data sharing program. According to this guy, the lawyers within with whom the hub had consulted were very afraid of GDPR, which is weird because GDPR is a European thing. Why are you worried about election integrity having to do with GDPR? Hmm. And, and, this is very strange, all right? We've had many conversations with different legal teams, however, and as of now, it isn't looking good, all right? Now, that the reason why is because it lists about 50 Facebook accounts in order of date of birth. You're doxing people right there, and in many cases, Twitter accounts that repost the Facebook content. All right, a few of these accounts you've already suspended most of these Facebook accounts have the same date of birth. That's kind of interesting. At least one of these, Rima's Malaysia, is also active at, on Instagram, and there are clear suggestions that the same actor is running both the Twitter and Facebook accounts. That's interesting. I mean, right. just because they had the same birthday? Okay. Well, you know... 50 Facebook accounts with the same birthday that were posting similar content that might actually sure. was that Shaba ranks or Shaggy? I think it might've been Shaggy. Boom. Shaggy. Right. So also I remember in 2020, there were a <laughs> lot of conversations, even in my company that was based out of Europe about GDPR, but I can't imagine why this Twitter censorship having to do with Russian accounts would be worried about GDPR because Russia doesn't even participate in GDPR. When asked about these, these concerns, Linville wrote, well, I'm not an attorney. I'm not confident in my understanding of the law or my ability to articulate concerns raised by our institution related to the proposed agreement. So basically I was talking on my ass and letting other people speak for me. And that's probably not such a good idea. Regardless, but I'll do it again. I'll fucking do it again. <laughs> Regardless, it remains clear that the media forensics hub has, or at least had, considerable reach. A prime example of how academic anti disinformation research can act as a relay station between federal law enforcement, the corporate press, and internet platforms. And that's what it's trying to do is to show that pipeline and that interconnectedness 
and that incestuousness. Game of Thrones? Kind of. James says that below are a few other noteworthy emails you might find in this FOIA disclosure, which we've uploaded again in full to the Racket FOIA library. The Hub's activities are almost too extensive to fully document, but among the highlights are its initial contact with, the C with CISA, its advocacy on behalf of a NATO official, and its concerns about tweets touting the efficacy of the Russian COVID-19 vaccine. Weird. Yeah. Right? In October... I, I, they, how dare they... How, how dare like, they develop Question nice... the efficacy of a vaccine. That's... That's... There must be anti-vax, Indy. How, that's terrible. Bad cookies. You You're know? not an attorney, but you will create the sources that attorneys will point to when they argue about Russian troll farms. You're influencing the law. Yep. Yep. In October 2018, Linville described his team's methodology for identifying Twitter accounts they attributed to Russian Internet Research Agency, the IRA. One of the criteria that he cited is commonalities in the email with which the account is registered. When Roth pointed out that the email address used to register an account is not public information, how did you get it? Well, he revealed that his team's methodology for gathering that information we pretend to have forgot the password and infer from the shortened email. So it says, huh. you know, when you say you forgot your password, it says, we sent the email to in blah, 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 blah at gmail.com. Yeah. That's pretty fucked up. Mm -hmm. In February of 2019, Linville and Warren made contact with Matthew Masterson of CISA. Masterson currently serves as Microsoft's Director of Information Integrity. Ah, no conflict of interest there. He also spent a year as a non-resident fellow at the now-dissolving Stanford Internet Observatory. Hmm. Their initial correspondence was arranged by Twitter public policy manager Kevin Kane. So you've got Twitter, Microsoft, Everybody's all con the Stanford Internet Observatory guy, right? And CISA. So that's not good. In July of 2019, again, oh. this is stuff stuff going back four and five years. We're doing forensic deep dives into what happened, how these agencies were created, what the idea and framework behind them were, and how they operated, so that we can be aware for 2024 to see what they're trying to do because they're. They claimed that they were going to be ramping this up. I remember we called this a couple of weeks ago. That their idea was to run another version of this times three. They wanted like three or eight election integrity partnerships to be running simultaneously. So by all means, read this. This is, again, over at Racket, and you have to be a paid member. So that's why I want to go through this. All right, Linville raised concerns about Roth's failure to suspend an account he believed was being operated by the Internet Research Agency, the Russian agency, alleged. He described his team's exchanges with Roth as exceedingly one-sided, meaning they're trying to pin this on the Russians and they're Russiagating Roth, and he's resisting at that point. But you know what happens after a bunch of time of doing that? It wears on you. So that by... August of 2020, when they're ready to set Roth up for the tabletop exercise about Hunter Biden's laptop, he's a lot more yeah. receptive to it. And they end up censoring DMs of the New York Post article. In November of 2019, Linville mentioned how a colleague from the NATO Strategic Communication Center of Excellence in Latvia wanted to know why certain Twitter accounts had been suspended. This colleague was doing research on QAnon. Okay, why does Latvia from NATO Strategic <laughs> Comms want to know about QAnon? Yeah. Well, because they need to know how to better lie about it, pretty much. You know? In October 2020... Linville made reference to the Media Forensics Hub's work with the Commission on Presidential Debates 
to identify Twitter accounts with various obvious signs of inauthenticity. Here we go. We, they keep going. They keep going and going. Finally, in March of 2022, this one's unbelievable. Linville emailed Roth and Twitter threat disruption analyst William Newland. You know that last name, right? Ah, brother of yeah. the decades-long Department of State fixture, Victoria Newland. He yeah. asked. He asked for help in convincing Meta to remove the Russian language Instagram accounts mentioned above and encourage them to provide their colleagues at Facebook with any knowledge that might prove helpful. Linville wrote, quote, given the ongoing war in Ukraine and the daily atrocities taking place, thanks to Ukraine bombing the Donbass, but that's not what he said, I'm sure we can all agree shutting down Russian state information on every platform is in our shared best interests. They wanted to Alex Jones, these people. Newland who conveniently also used to work at Facebook, responded by noting that they are 100% aligned on the importance of getting this stuff right mitigated across the whole platform ecosystem. And I remember we had talked yeah. about that guy, Mudge Zatko, who brought in its Aletheia <laughs> group, all right? Aletheia okay. group was Frank trying... Zapp Frank Zappa's long-lost son. Maybe. No, Zatko, mm. not Zappa. But, <laughs> but that guy, yeah. through his friends at the Aletheia Group, were trying to map internet behavior across social media platforms so that they could potentially try to get people shut down across them. Like they did yeah. to Alex Jones, like they tried to do to Trump. <laughs> yeah. Right. So according to Newland, the Twitter team was in close touch with its peers in tech and rival companies were generally aware of one another's approaches to abuse mitigation. The reason why is because they all hire each other's tech and IT They're security people. Yeah. Yeah. So again, there is a media forensics hub FOIA production uh, right here. And that is an entire free, free to all, um, article that has all of the raw emails, more than 250 plus pages of FOIA productions and results pertaining to just the Clemson University Forensics Media Hub. Well, and I'm right. sure there's a lot more than Clemson. Well, here in involved. the Racket FOIA library, you've got the ones that we've covered in the past, the Gary Kasparov one. We didn't actually read that article, but that's available. And the stuff about Kate Starbird and the University of Washington that we covered. Sure. All right. So Cookies is asking a good question here. How is this not state-driven propaganda? How is this different from the fascism they blame Russia of being? And this is this is like Soviet Russia. This isn't even like current modern day Russia. Well, the Soviet Russia we were lied into believing. But yes. Yes. Um, Right? Yeah. Tara Reed, welcome um, to the stream. How do we miss that? Hi. Who are these people? Let's let's give Tara who are these people. Who are these people? There you go. There you go. Everybody follow Tara over mm -hmm. on Instagram and TikTok. She has new accounts over there. I believe it's at real Tara Reed in both cases. So check her out over there. Speaking of a couple of bucks. The rent is too damn high. Yeah. We're all getting squeezed, everyone. So if there's any way that you're able to, we know it's tough out there for everyone. A couple of bucks. Again, Sarah was was really generous, and, and she was able to help us out with, with, with some money this weekend. Um, and we're going to get, we're trying to get Jesse a new computer. We had a part blow on Reef's machine. I had a power cable thing blow on my machine. You know, this is the regular stuff that we deal with on a regular, uh, on a daily basis, just in order to be able to do this stuff. So anything that anybody can do to help, certainly it it's appreciated and and necessary because we're we're not getting sponsor money and we're not getting advertiser dollars, and you guys are the only people that that we depend on for any kind of any kind of funding and any kind of of uh support so we deeply appreciate it um 